The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Good evening and welcome to Bronx Talk. Tonight's guest is the chair of the Bronx Democratic County Committee. He's also the assemblyman of the Bronx's 85th Assembly District, which includes the Bronx neighborhoods of Soundview, Classen Point, Longwood, and Hunts Point. We've got a lot to ask him about tonight from politics on the national and local scenes and some state and local issues as well. Please join me in welcoming back to Bronx Talk the BDCC chairman, Assemblyman Marcos Crespo. Nice to have you, sir. Thanks, Gary. Great let's to be. let's roll up our sleeves and, uh, and and get um, right into it. Um, let's just talk about democratic unity as we approach uh, 2020 and the 2020 elections. Normally, we talk about primaries coming up, but we don't have anything this year. Um, uh, there is the the squad and the progressive movement that's challenging the status quo. In fact, they will be uh, running a number of candidates against um, well-established incumbents. How do you see the whole specter of this growing, and, and we'll talk about the local movement, but on the national scene, do you see that as helpful because it challenges people to maybe do better, or do you think it's really a problem because it, it breaks up unity in the party? Well, it, it's a little bit of both. Um, on the positive side, activism is good, democracy is good, the exercise of it is good. Challenging uh, elected so that we're not too comfortable and we're always reminded to get back out to organize our operations to keep people uh, attuned to things is, is a good thing, it's a good exercise. And, um, on the other hand, it can have its effects. I mean, right now, we have one enemy as Democrats, and that's President Trump and everyone who is following suit with his rhetoric, with his uh, anti-immigrant uh, stances, and his uh, disdain for anything that is about uplifting uh, the lower income classes. And so uh, we need to fight that, and we need to focus our energies on that fight. Um, so I think the, the drawback to some of this activism is that it's targeting, it's infighting, it's targeting each other, it's, it's people who are on the same side of the issue um, spending our energies and our resources uh, protecting ourselves rather than focusing on the real problems. So there are issues that all Democrats, I would think, see eye to eye on gun control, climate change, immigration perhaps. Um, but yet, you have uh, people, you know, if um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and they suggest, the, the, you know, the Green New Deal, other Democrats are like, oh my goodness, no, rather than say, well, it's a good start, but let's have a dialogue. And then, of course, on the other side, they're like, if you don't push this through, right. then you're cheating well, the public. And I think I think that's that that's a great example, right? It's it's not a disagreement overall on policy. It's how do you get there and how do you deliver it? And I think one of the positive things of this movement and, and people like Alexandria and others is the fact that they are challenging norms that would have otherwise been felt like, well, we can't get through this issue. It's just too hard. The, the other side will never come through. And they're saying, no, we need to force this conversation. And they're, they're forcing those important conversations and bringing issues to the table. That's good. Um, in terms of how how you deliver, though, at the national level plays out differently. Locally, we could talk about these issues. Internally, the Bronx is one community, and, and there's a lot of commonality. Uh, but when you're trying to bring Democrats who represent, you know, more suburban communities, or you're representing farming communities, or you're representing distressed communities, or where there's very little uh, 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 racial uh, diversity, they don't necessarily see the issues the same way. And it takes a different approach to get them there. Um, and I think that's where we need to be a little bit careful sometimes with the aggressive messaging can you can push some folks away that should be allies. I often see things um, through a Bronx prism, maybe you do the same, we're both Bronx boys, mm -hmm. who, you know, grew up and live here. When, when the president uh, told them to go back where they came from, I was thinking about 
you know, how many times I was in the schoolyard and, we, you know, somebody kept calling fouls and they got into an argument. If somebody said, go back where you came from, uh, you know, to use Bronx terminology, that's grounds for dismissal. Well, let me tell you, th this president has done a lot of things that have raised eyebrows and made people, you know, uh, just, just fall to the floor. But honestly, this was one of the most despicable comments because it's more than just a comment. It's more than what he intended to say. It's where it comes from in a person to go there uh, and, to, and to try to diminish the stature and the responsibility and the leadership of four elected officials and the uh, congressional officials at that, um, I think was just despicable, it's disgusting, and it just speaks to the level of racism that is ingrained in who President Trump is and the people around him. So, I, I, and you're really feeding into what my next question is. So when the four of them, um, uh, Ocasio-Cortez of New York, Omar of Minnesota, Presley of Massachusetts, and Tlaib of Michigan defended themselves, other Democrats weren't there. And I, I, you know, I, I understand the sense of, of unity and the sense of outrage that many, certainly people in the Bronx, I feel that way, regardless of what your politics are. We just don't talk that way. But then they stood there alone. And I thought that if there was a show of unity, at least around that, aside from all the other issues, I, saw, I thought I saw, it was disturbing. I saw some responses. Um, I know we commented on it. I know many of my colleagues locally commented on it. And, and I don't know how many congressional officials made statements. I think a, a lot of folks did call it out for what it was. But it's just, I mean, you can't even you can't even dwell on it because he's thrown ten other absurd comments <laughs> since then. It's such a roller coaster of absurdity. You, you almost become desensitized and just say, w I can't even spend time thinking about this one. He's we're on to the next one. It, it's it's masterful almost of his uh, psychology to to kind of put us through this roller coaster. It's effective for his side of the issue. We can't lose sight of this. The fact of the matter is, uh, this president and the things he says speak to a real problem in this country. The the issues we're seeing socially speak to these problems in this country. We have issues that we need to address. Some of these elected officials are able to talk about it, but we cannot let our few differences get in the way of the things that bring us together, and I think there's more of that, and we should be working on those. Let, let, let's talk about um, uh, Congresswoman uh, Ocasio-Cortez from the Bronx, obviously, and partially in Queens. Um, I, I remember last year, uh, right about this time when we conducted uh, this interview, she had recently won the primary, and I had asked, you know, there had been a little tension in the reported. I had asked if you had had conversations with her. You said no, not yet. Um, is there a relationship between um, you, either you personally or the, the uh, uh, county um, Democratic Party and, and her, or is it still kind of, well, she, she clearly is a very well a publicized person. Uh, it, tell me about well, that. Look, um, no, there hasn't been any contact or communication or real working relationship. She's doing her thing in D.C. and um, I've seen reports that she's, you know, been in the district holding some events. We've uh, extended the invitation to some of the things that we've done at county, but um, no, there hasn't been that participation. We hope at some point that we could do that. Uh, she is, I believe, doing a, a, a great job at, at raising many important issues. Um, other issues we don't may not disagree agree on everything in the way it's presented but um, look I, I love my wife to death and I don't agree with her on everything <laughs> uh, the fact is that uh, ultimately we do Somebody agree on expunge that <laughs> from the record no no I, I, I said this at the county dinner at the county uh, committee meeting uh, the fact is this I, again I keep coming back to this this idea that Democrats have to all agree on everything all the time is just nonsensical there is no such thing as any group of people agreeing on everything all of the time but we have fundamental policies that we all agree on and we all know one thing we all agree on Trump and his administration and we and not allowing him to have another four years of this debacle is the best thing for the country and I think that should be the priority um, when you look at the Democratic field right now uh, there are so many Democrats and and many of them it's almost a merge of candidates they all sound the same they're all saying the same thing at some point we can't make the mistakes that we made in 2016 we need to start consolidating who has the ability to win more votes in key states and get us a Democratic victory that should be our focus. Uh, I don't want to uh, dwell too long on it. I'm just curious. Um, uh, it appears there are three leaders uh, emerging uh, in, in the Democratic race, Elizabeth Warren, uh, Bernie Sanders, and uh, Joe Biden. You have a favorite? Do you have a thought about that? Or at this point, whoever it is? No, I'll I support. think we're open. I think all of them bring a lot to the table, great ideas, name recognition, popularity in, in key areas. 
uh, Biden, you know, resonates with uh, many of those same communities that Democrats expected to win in 2016, but but did not. And uh, but I think uh, you know we're seeing the econ the economic issues that have been raised by Bernie and Elizabeth, for example, resonate with Americans across this country who are feeling the pinch. While reports say the economy is doing well, uh, that's not necessarily being felt well, by right everyday now, Americans. Right now, all the reports are not saying. So that. well, yeah. right now, there's truth coming out about some exaggerations, but the fact is. The average Americans are not necessarily feeling any better about their economic situation. The money's not going any further. They're not covering basic necessities. And so the message of, of both Warren and, and Sanders resonates. I think in, if you look at some of the debates, I think someone like Kamala Harris has really stood out uh, with her passion and, and her ability to sort of, you know, give the, the, the pertinent comment at the right time. I think she stood out. And Castro, I got to mention him. I think he's uh, done very well in the debates. And it's great to see for a Latino like me to see a Latino really stand out in, amongst the field. I, I, I think there's some really promising candidates, but it needs to start dwindling down. Uh, let's talk um, a little more locally um, about uh, challenges to candidates. Do you see, and, and I'll use, um, because uh, his opponent has already raised his hand, and that would be uh, Elliot Engel is going to mm -hmm. have an opponent. Do you see that as a healthy thing, or do you say, hey, look, we've got to, you know, p surround the, the, the wagons the, and 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 defend our incumbents and people who have done well for us in the past. One doesn't preclude the other. The fact is, I think democracy is healthy. I think elections are healthy. I, obviously, as a candidate, of course, we would like not to have an opponent. We want everybody to love us and everybody to like us and agree that we're doing a great job. But you know what? It actually helps uh, when, again, when you go through this process and you're keeping your your, your reputation, your name, your, your, your work product, and you're promoting that and, and reminding people about all the things you're accomplishing, the average person gets up every day, goes about their day. They're not looking to spend a significant amount of that studying all the work that their local assembly member, senator, congressional official did. So it's not something that necessarily are always attuned to. So campaigns allow us to do that, to remind folks what we've done, what we've accomplished, what we've delivered. Somebody like Elliot has done an amazing job. Right now, the fact that we have a Democrat from the Bronx, uh, I was covering some of Westchester, but somebody playing a key role in one of the most important committees for national issues um, is a win for our community. So I think we're very happy to support Elliot and continue to support him. The campaigns that have popped up are bringing, are raising some interesting issues. But I think that's part of the process, and we can't shy away from it or be afraid of it. And the fact is, it's not new. We've always had races in the Bronx. We've always had challenges. Nothing new. Uh, I, I'm going to, a little self-promotion here, he's coming on the show next week, so we'll beget to ask him <laughs> directly all of all of these things. So um, let's talk about uh, the Bronx Democratic County Committee. Um, there obviously have been challenges. This There is a progressive movement. I, I don't like labeling it as one or the other, but that is what, it, what mm -hmm. it's being called. And, um, you know, I know you just went through a whole... Uh, they, there was a meeting in February that was somewhat raucous, and then uh, a meeting uh, more recently in August. Um, I guess the challenges were to say, we want in. We want to be part of a, a, a dialogue so that all Democrats, maybe not a, you're not going to support everybody, but at least we can participate in the dialogue, be a little better respected, those kinds of things. What are your thoughts? Well, look. We're all ears to ideas on how to improve the party, and we proved that um, with some of the actions that we took of late. Uh, but, but I think it cannot be lost to folks in the Bronx. The Bronx Democratic Party has everything to be proud of in the way it's operated and the work it's done. Um, have we gotten everything right? No. Has everybody been stellar? Absolutely not. But no institution is. We're not perfect. We are. We are working elected officials, Democrats in this borough who have delivered. And you've seen the transition of the improvements that have happened in our borough in many facets of life, still a lot to accomplish. But the fact of the matter is this, um, we had a meeting last year. And in that meeting, a small group, it, it is a small group of elected Democratic County Committee members who who speak of the party as if they don't necessarily belong to it, but nonetheless, they have other ideas, they believe we should act differently, proposed 10 uh, changes to our rules. We accepted those changes in last year's meetings. We said we would review, we would recommend them to the Rules Committee. Rules Committee met earlier this year, and now in the meeting that we held just a few weeks back, we adopted all 10 of those proposals. The proposals included things like how many meetings are held, how people are notified. We accepted all of the things they asked us for. Unfortunately, some, several of those same people who made those recommendations decided to vote no at the time that we adopted the rules. What it proves so wait, to me- So you're saying that they voted no for rules For the very things they, they recommended. For and I think it, it goes to show that for some, there are those progressives or, 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 or other Democrats who, or, or whatever label uh, some folks are using, who are honestly trying to 
help us maybe change the way we do things so that we are more open and transparent, great. And we're all ears for that. Nobody's ever opposed to having those conversations. But when you're just going in with the mindset of, I'm just going to oppose whatever it is because I'm there to be opposition, then that's not productive. That's not helping. That was my speech at the end of the meeting was simply that Democrats need to start coming together and fighting our real enemy, which is Donald Trump and his policies, Republican policies. And we need to stop going after each other and undermining each other because that's not helping our communities. I think it would really be um, instructive for people to understand some of the rules. And, and so you mentioned very briefly about how you're going to inform people. What, what, are the, what is a change, for example, that you think really was a good change that was suggested? It was very, and now you've put it it was very technical things. One, one was guaranteeing or assuring that there were more meetings held per year annually of the county committee. Um, I think sometimes it's misconstrued what role the county committee plays. The county committee not only approves the rules of the party uh, every year, but also if there is a vacancy in a particular district, the county committee of that district would come together to nominate the Democratic nominee, not who would be elected, but the Democratic nominee that would then face mm -hmm. whatever challenges for that seat. Um, but in the absence of those uh, uh, situations, there really is no other need for the actions by that county committee. Um, and so I think there are some people out there uh, telling folks that they have been denied the chance to be elected leaders who make these decisions or other decisions when that's not necessarily the role. So I think I want people to understand, and they can visit our website, the Bronx Democratic Party website, to learn more about what each of the roles are and, and how you get involved. There are seats available, so we're welcoming everybody's participation. That's actually what my next question was going to be, is how do you get on the county committee? Because it, it seems that's kind of like a, you know, the fuel that drives no, the engine. it's never been a secret. It's, it's simple as this. If you want to know about the Mets or Yankees, you follow ESPN, and you follow the website, and you look it up, and you read it. It's the same thing with us. People who want to get involved just need to reach out to the local leaders. Wherever you live in the Bronx, you have district leaders who help organize uh, the political operation in your particular district. You can visit any of your elected officials and let them know, or you can come directly to the Bronx Democratic Party headquarters through our website and sign up and let us know that you want to get involved. And, and if there are vacancies, we recommend those to the local leaders so that those people can run for those positions. They're also, I mean, in an open election, they, anybody can choose to run for one of those seats and participate in the process, and we welcome that participation. We are not in this business to uh, for anything other than to improve the quality of life in this borough. We all live here as elected officials. I'm raising my daughters here. My passion is so that the Bronx continues to improve. And as chair of the party, I just want the party to be a vehicle to achieve that. Is there any similarity to the uh, so-called Rainbow Rebellion that we had in 2008? Do you see that as say, well, there's a whole movement of people who are getting together who are saying, I'll you know I'll tell you what? what's different. I'll tell you what's different. That, the, well, Rainbow, the, the, Rainbow Rebellion, the Rainbow Rebellion was an exercise where elected officials who were who were working towards that improvement realized that the party was not serving that interest as well as it should and decided to take over and change that leadership and organize and bring unity and bring communities together in order to achieve that. What we're seeing now are challenges from, in, in, in some cases from people who have been around, but in most cases these are people who have just moved into the community, are, are, are only coming into the neighborhood to organize against us because of a narrative that they have to fight the establishment. Not because they're from here, not because they're necessarily been around or seen the struggles that we've had over the years. Although some and actually, have. I mean, some, I no, 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 that's what I, I'm not, I'm not generalizing. I'm saying okay. we're seeing a large portion of this activism and the rhetoric against us on social media and other places coming from people outside. Folks who have been here, who see the changes that have happened in our community and who have lived here long enough to sort of see who's been a part of what movements, appreciate the work that we've done because it's been a progression over, over a number of years. Um, and some of the people who are commenting aggressively haven't really been, had to, taken the time to study or understand the amount of work and the successes of many of our elected officials and what the party has delivered. So that's the difference. We, uh, I, I will just say we, you are going to be very busy over the next year with all the council members that are going to be term limited mm -hmm. out. Uh, there'll be a, a races literally all over the place. Maybe the most visible one because the candidates have all thrown their hats in the, I don't say all because there, maybe there's going to be more. Many have thrown their hats in the rings already is the one to replace uh, Congressman uh, Serrano. Uh, there, I, I don't want. I, I'm going to list them, but uh, sure. obviously Richie Torres and Michael Blake, uh, Marlene Cintron, uh, Melissa Mark Viverito, just to name a few. Uh, Councilmember Diaz as well. Um, how do you sort that out, and how do you see that race with people that you've supported in the past, people who have performed well in either their jobs or in their elected office, and then how do you sort that out, and do you anticipate? that uh, the uh, BDCC will uh, endorse a candidate? Uh, we always look forward to making an endorsement as a political organization. That's what we do, and, and we look forward to 
uh, hopefully being in a position to, to support a specific candidate and, and, and help them to victory. Um, but this is a, a challenging one. First of all, I must take the opportunity to just thank Congressman Serrano for his years of service, um, a legend in, in our communities for what he's accomplished, not only for the Latino community, but for the Bronx. Um, and we're extremely proud of him and, and wish him all the best as he continues to deal with uh, his health situation. In regards to the seat, a lot of friends, a lot of members who are active with the party, a lot of folks who I've supported over the years and some who have been very supportive of me. Um, and, and we're having these conversations. Uh, it's not going to be an easy choice. A lot of quality ideas are being put forward and individuals who could do this job very well uh, in D.C. Uh, but it's going to be an interesting race. Um, every candidate also has significant questions to, to respond to the community about. And I think all of that uh, should play out over the next few months. We're going to take our time. I'm not going to rush to judgment. Um, we want to see what candidates can put together. We want to see how the community responds to that. And, and we want to flush out some more answers as to what their what their goals are and what their vision is for the district. We talked about it the, toward the top of the show about uh, issues that unify Democrats. Um, Councilmember Diaz would seem to not embody many of those issues. He brought Ted Cruz to the Bronx. He's mm -hmm. outwardly saying that he does uh, support um, uh, President Trump. Um, is he an outlier in, in this? In, in other words, he, he's distinctive. It certainly is possible, I, conceivable, that the Republicans could even put some uh, resources to, to support him. Tell you what, he certainly stands out in the field uh, for his uh, unique positions on, on key issues and uh, social issues that are, that are really being uh, top of the agenda in Washington. So, yeah, that, those are going to be challenges for Councilmember Diaz to overcome uh, if he continues in this race. At the same time, he's also considered to be wildly more popular than any of the other candidates on the ground within those communities that are part of this district. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see where, how voters respond. Do they go with someone that they consider to be a local and responsive uh, you know, leader? Or do they go with somebody who addresses these major topics that are talked about in, in those circles? And I think um, that's to be seen. Uh, not sure. We haven't taken a position on any particular. Case. I, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm smiling because yes, you say, well, how the voters will perceive it. Of course, it'll be interesting how the party perceives it. That's true too. <laughs> oh boy, I tried. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and um, just back to process. So the, then the process goes. It goes to the membership to um, raise their hands. Yeah, we, we we have these conversations on an ongoing basis. Where members are, what they'd like to see. We listen to the district leaders, state committee members. Um, we try to have as many folks chime in and tell us what they're thinking and obviously uh, a lot of it has to do also with how the candidates you know organize their campaigns who positions themselves the best what they represent and who best speaks to the best future for that district um, and so again like I said th this is a, a crowded field of many people we have worked with and know and respect and um, it's not going to be an easy decision I'm guessing and and you can agree or disagree that these challenges and this whole uh, climate is going to be very good for the process because uh, voters, uh, let's talk specifically about the Bronx, will be energized um, if we have a race as interesting and, and competitive as that one uh, looks like it's going to be. I think it'll energize the populace. It'll bring people out to vote in general when we've had low turnout chronically in the right. Bronx. No, I think so too. And, and again, there's a historic nature to this district. This is the epicenter of so much change that's happening in the borough. And I think voters in that district want to hear um, how these officials envision what that future looks like for the district. So uh, there's a lot at stake. Um, it's interesting also that, uh, you know, the rules for congressional races are a little bit different, and there's some people running who aren't necessarily, some are not from that community specifically. And so Which you're how permitted voters, to do. How, well, you're permitted to do that. And so how voters respond to those candidates versus those that may have a more local message or history, it's, it's all going to be very interesting. We're going to pay close attention to it, uh, but we're not going to rush the judgment. I want to uh, switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about Puerto Rico, of course, important to Bronxites, of course, important to you as well. Uh, there's been an upheaval. Uh, many people People see that as good. I thought it was very ironic because, of course, there's uh, significant upsetness over the kind of support that uh, President Trump has not given. And in fact, he yeah. said some things as the most recent hurricane was coming uh, along its way. But one thing he did say, which to me resonated, and that was, "Why would I give money to a corrupt government, even if you know they deserve or there is a real, real need here?" And so I'm not evaluating whether or not he should, but I'm evaluating. Um, I guess the the stability of, of the government in Puerto Rico and combined with the serious needs, many of which just left over well, from Hurricane Maria. I would say that Puerto Rico, despite its challenges, has demonstrated to have a healthier democracy than, than we have right now in Washington, D.C. When the community can stand up, challenge 
uh, the actions of a governor, question the, uh, the, the issues that were raised of, of particular corruption, and actually get that governor to listen to the people, step down, and allow someone else to take over. I mean, we've seen millions of people mobilized around this country based on everything that Trump has done, which challenges every fundamental portion of our Constitution. And yet, there he is continuing to, you know, act up and do whatever he wants and be above the law. But in Puerto Rico, we saw it actually play out where the people had the power. Um, so I would say their democracy seems to be a little healthier than, than here. Um, and in terms of the rhetoric, I think it's so disingenuous and insulting and offensive and just flat out lies. Uh, first of all, the president keeps talking about 90 plus billion dollars authorized. Not true. Only 40 plus billion were authorized in Puerto Rico, and only a handful of that, single digits in my understanding, has been actually delivered uh, to those programs that are needed in the island. So we have not received the resources, and that was a big part of the problems on the island. I, I, we understand that many of those resources went to waste, the, the ones that were delivered because there was no system. Minimal compared to, very minimal right. compared to how much is needed to execute real work, redevelopment, energy sector, um, and the environment in Puerto Rico. I could, uh, and, and you, uh, I guess, would agree with the Bronx Pride, the way the Bronxites uh, responded to Maria, and, and the, the, <laughs> there was a gymnasium full of goods and, and things, and uh, oh, really they, warmed my heart. It was just, the diaspora, it was just beautiful. The work that Diaspora did, and I got a shout out Governor Cuomo, Nick and the Velasquez, former President, did former president Diaz. Yeah. We, I mean, the mobilization was amazing. Uh, we only have a moment left. Um, legislation that you're looking forward to in the state next year. We can uh, review all the stuff that happened last time, but what's sure. coming up, and as you get to the first of the year, what are you going to look to do? One of the first, I'm now chair of the Labor Committee in the State Assembly, and one of the first bills that I want to get done is Carlos Law. Uh, we have a serious problem. We just saw the building collapse in Norwood, uh, where unfortunately a, a construction worker, an immigrant construction worker who lives in Soundview, uh, passed away and other family members were hurt in that accident. Uh, we have a serious problem when, when uh, certain construction sites allow for unsafe conditions that lead to the death of workers and the law does not provide them accurate uh, relief. It, the life of a construction worker who perishes in one of these construction accidents can lead to at most a $5,000 fine. That is uh, unconscionable, and it continues to be immigrant workers who go through this. So we're working with the labor community, with our unions, to ensure that with Carlos Law, we create real penalties, real liability for those uh, owners of properties and construction companies uh, that operate these sites. Uh, one very quick question. Ethics reform on, on your list of things that you'd it, like to Ethics see? is one of those things that comes up every year. If there are new <laughs> ideas, we review them. But there's a reason and, for and that. Certainly, <laughs> well, and the rules have worked. Have you seen every elected official, for the plethora of elected officials and other leaders who have who have gotten in trouble, it's been the rules in place that have allowed us uh, to punish them accordingly. And so uh, that's something we'll consistently review. We did it with sexual harassment in the workplace, and we'll continue to do more uh, as we move forward. Uh, Chairman uh, Crespo, Assemblyman Crespo, you're an excellent guest. We'd love to have you here, and we Anytime. hope you'll come back soon. Thank you. Okay, folks, if you have further questions or comments on anything you heard on tonight's show or anything going on in the Bronx, email them to us at bronxtalk at bronxnet.org. You send us a tweet at bronxtalk or you post them on our Facebook page. As I mentioned earlier, next week, another important political program, Congressman Elliot Engel, who is, as mentioned on the program, the chair of the House Foreign Relations Committee, will be our guest. We thank our producer, Helen Greenberg, our director, William Guzman, and uh, we shot the show tonight uh, at uh, the Mercy College Studios, and so we thank BronxNet for the great facilities and the great crew, and we'll see you next week. Good night.